Welcome to the Startup Grind. Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Scott, for joining us. Um, let's start at the beginning. Tell us how you went from working at a big company like Procter & Gamble to deciding to start a company to make PC software, which was sort of, maybe that was like deciding to start a web startup uh, today. Uh, well, my wife and I moved out in 1980, and uh, I was working in Bain, and she eventually got a job in software publishing. So I got to see what a small software company was like. And I uh, coded a little bit when I was in high school, but hadn't done any sense, so I got intrigued by all that. And then one day, she complained about doing the bills. She's very good at it. It wasn't a, a problem thing, it just was a hassle. You know, it was you know, redundant, recurring clerical work. Uh, that she did for our joint checking account. And it occurred to me, this sounds like a classic P&G style business. To try to find a problem that everybody has, whether it's you know, deodorant or laundry or diapering babies. Uh, and then where can you use technology to solve that problem better than it's ever been solved before? And it struck me that PCs, even as feeble as they were in 1983 and 82, could actually do a good job of this, because it's just redundant calculation of data structure. So that started me on the journey, first to build something for her, and then to say, and then to explore, is this actually a large problem that a lot of people have that we can go solve? So that's how it started. And uh, I remember those days, so I know that Quicken had lots of competition. It did, it did not succeed, because it was the only option people had uh, but did it succeed because you had a better product, or were there other things you did as a startup that helped you get off to a good start? Yeah, uh, that's right. There were a couple dozen personal finance software products already on the market. Uh, some were broadly sold. So we had the last mover advantage. Uh, but our approach was very different. Those products were all loaded up on features. Um, back then, the view was the more features, the better. So. They would do balance sheets, and graphs, budgets, <coughs> assets, liabilities, investments. They do all that stuff. But we went in to understand customers fresh. And I started calling uh, households in Palo Alto and Winneka just on phone calls to find out what did you actually do with your finances? And what was the problem? Or what was the pain? What was the hassle? And what we learned from that is most people did very few things in their finances. Just the basics, pay bills, figure out how much money you have. And they want it to be fast and easy, because nobody likes doing this stuff. And there wasn't a single competitor who was doing it. Their products were big, complicated, and slow. So where they made an aircraft carrier, we made a speed <coughs> And the purpose of Quicken was single-minded, save the time and hassle. This was the area of MS DOS, so but you couldn't make it particularly beautiful at the start, I assume. <coughs> Yeah, it wasn't, but he was also really can understand it. Because we started doing testing, uh, software testing, uh, what's now called usability testing. We didn't have a word for it back then. But we uh, get people from the Palo Alto Junior League to come by, and we give them the software on a computer. These were non computer users, they never touched a PC. And we'd say, now write a print a check. And they had to figure out how to do it. And they got stuck, and they had problems, and we'd watch, and we'd inquire what was going on. And then we'd go back and redesign it. And then a week later, try again. And so one thing that we applied was an idea that I had taken from the uh, uh, Lisa development team, which was to make the screens, I mean, it's obvious today, back then nobody had done it, make the screens look like the real thing. So our data entry screen looked like a check. The database screen looked like a check register. So, and we did that in the 80 character green screen. So, uh, so you can use design to make things intuitive, hence the name of the company, even when you only had a character <coughs> green screen. And this was at a time I mean, when the average American did not have a computer. I mean, by right. definition, almost everybody was new to PCs, not just to Quicken. Yes, and we were building on the IBM PC, which virtually no one had. So um, how quickly was it clear that you were onto something and this company might succeed? Was, was that obvious from the start? Um, what was obvious for those of us in the company um, until we launched. Um, and then things didn't work very well. Um, turns out back then you had to go through software distribution to get the software stores, and computer stores, and nobody would take our products. We had no money. Uh, the VCs all turned us down. Um, 
we talked to over two dozen venture capitalists. They were ultimately in the all turns now. Even my college room, uh, high school, excuse me, even my uh, grad school roommate was a VC turned me down. Um, <laughs> and so we had no money, so we couldn't get into distribution, and the other products were already out there. So it was really a struggle. We, the little amount of money that I got from the retirement part from my parents, we went through that. We had to, we had to return the rented computers and the rented furniture. We uh, brought in card tables, as those were our desks. We used crates of unsold products as printer stands. We had lots of crates of unsold products. So, um, yeah, I f later found a bank statement from August of that year, and I think we had like $17 in the bank. Were there any near death experiences along the way? Yeah, that was not yeah. clear. Yeah. 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 yeah, we'd stop paying salaries. I went to the folks saying, look, we're out of money. I'll pay for the time you work, but you know, I, it's not a layoff. I'd dearly love you to stay, but you know, some of you might have to get work that actually pays. Uh, and so, four of, of the seven of us, four stayed uh, and worked through that six months where we had no no pay. So yeah, it was. It looked like a certain failure. And then, was there a magic moment uh, that you can define looking back when you knew it? That, you succeeded, and I assume you did get into distribution eventually. Uh, there was not actually a magic moment. Uh, we, we didn't have the resources to change the product, so we had the same product. Uh, because Tom, our co founder, who did the engineering, well, we were so busy just trying to handle the business, he didn't have time to code that, uh, trying to save things. We eventually got some distribution through banks. Banks started selling it to their customers. But it turns out banks are terrible selling software, it's not their business, so that didn't work. Uh, but that got a little word of mouth. And then we, from the bank stuff, we finally saved a little money that we decided to we were get big or get out. So I got a friend to teach me, uh, a friend from PG to teach me how to write direct response ads. And I wrote, because we couldn't afford an ad agency, I wrote the ads, print ads, and went in the computer magazines. Those ads with lots and lots of text. Yes, yeah, lots and lots of text. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and that started to work. Those ads, we could track the exact. The advertising I like is the advertising you exactly track, unlike the Super Bowl ad we ran last week. But the ads I like are the ones you can track. And, the, uh, and you can actually track it and they would pay back, which is a rare feat in advertising. Um, but actually, if we went back and looked at the numbers, what actually saved us, the reason most people were buying the product was word of mouth. Word of mouth from a friend. So through the banks, we got a few people use it, they told their friends, and the business started tripling every year, tripled, tripled, tripled. Um, and when you have lots of demand, then software distribution is easy. The, uh, so then things just took off. Um, and was your competition in the early days, I mean, was it a checkbook register as much as it was anything else? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Did you convince people about this idea of, yeah. of using the computer to do this at all? Yeah, the two dozen products were out virtually nobody used because they didn't, they didn't want it to be, consumers didn't want it to be complicated, hard, and slow. Like, duh. So they didn't use them. So the only real competition we had in the minds of customers was the pencil and the check. But that means it's a big habit change. So that's why ultimately they really had to hear from the friend. And I kind of still my belief that brands are built by your product and what others say about it. They're not built by what you say about yourself. So it, it was a viral success the next day. It's just the virality that didn't happen quite as quickly as it <laughs> happened today. Yeah, exactly. It was, we couldn't get trial early on, so it, we were it took off on word of mouth, but that took a while to get started. So Quicken eventually did become a big success, and uh, in the 90s you launched QuickBooks, which, I mean, it didn't just redefine into it, it really kind of changed how small businesses ran themselves. Was it a happy accident, or did you yes. see an opportunity to do something kind of no. transformative? No, it was totally an accident. Um, and it's taught me, uh, in the words of the former dean of the Harvard Business School, this thing of savoring surprises. But I didn't know that at the time. So we made Quicken, it was a home product. We sold it in a garish orange box, it looked like a Tide box. That's where I got that idea. Um, did not look like a business product. And we sold it as a consumer product. But in the tracking studies we did, half the users claimed to be businesses, or actually claimed to be using it in an office. Oh, they're probably just using the computer they have on their desk in the office, because most homes didn't have computers. And we ignored it. Every subsequent tracking study showed the same thing. 
half the users said they were using it in office. Ignore it. I ignore it. Years later, God damn it, fuck me. Why, why are people answering this question wrong? Um, so then we started to investigate. We went out and interviewed the people who had asked the question. And we went to visit them and see what was going on. And the reality was, they weren't doing homework. They were doing business work. They were doing business bookkeeping on a home phone. Then we had to figure out why, because there's dozens of accounting software products out there at the time. We had to figure out why. And it turns out, well, let's do a little survey right here. How many of you took accounting in school? Raise your hand. Okay, keep your hand if you loved accounting really like that. Okay, there's a, always a couple, and that's good. The rest of you are called normal. Um, because it's not natural for anyone to deal with debits and credits, and ledgers and journals, and posting and closes. Most people know how to close windows and doors, they don't know how to close books, and they don't know why they ever would. And in a small startup, or a small company, 5, 10, 20 employees, you don't have room for a CPA. So the books are kept by a unfortunate or unlucky clerk, a spouse, an office manager, or the owner. And the vast majority of cases, these people think the general ledger is a World War II hero. So they were using Quicken because we promised to keep your books like a checkbook, like you already know. But we never designed it for business. So we said, wait a minute, what if we actually took the same concept? Now that we know the giant unsolved problem is people need to keep books in English, rather than in accounting, which they don't understand. What if we actually built a problem to solve that problem? We did, we launched it with QuickBooks in 1991. And the launch was a total failure. The uh, unknown brand name, we were selling it at twice the price of the market leader, and we had a third as many features. Um, we, the advertising didn't work at all. Um, we removed the first ad, ran another one, an ad agency had done it for us, in PC Magazine, million circulation, largest trade journal in the world, we got four responses. Four. I'm pretty convinced if we'd run just a blank white page with an 800 number, we would have gotten better than four <laughs> responses. I think the large picture of the bald headed lady actually drove people away. Uh, then we found out uh, a few weeks after launch that customers started calling and they were really mad because it turns out there were some bugs. You'd enter all your business data for weeks, and then all of a sudden, one second, poof, it was all gone. Gone. Everything. Yeah, yeah, this was the great launch of, uh, and that meant everybody called, and which means the lines were so jammed you couldn't get through. So we, uh, we were scrambling. Um, so we doubled the size of the tech support department in a week, which training was easy because we only had training on one question. Where the bleep is my data? <laughs> we, the, the engineering team figured out the root cause of the problem, and we sent re-releases to people. And um, it, but that was the great start. We had the quickbooks. The intriguing thing is to then look at what happened in the business numbers. At the time, there was very good market share data because all software was sold through a collection of retailers that all reported their sales to a central neutral party. By the end of the second month, QuickBooks was outselling the former market leader two to one. Unbelievable. And we never, ever, even though we cut the advertising and all that stuff, we, we never, ever got below that. So we started at twice the market share of the market leader. And today, about 94% of the account systems in use by small businesses are if you look back, it's all because we solved the biggest problem, which was put it in plain English, make it look like an invoice, like a check. And we only did that because of a surprise. The surprise that we tried to ignore, I ignored for years, we finally paid attention to the surprise. We discovered this whole opportunity we had never. So let's fast forward to the current century and uh, the period a few years ago when personal finance was going online. You, you would pick an online. And there was a really cool startup called Mint, and it looked like those two products might be arch rivals, but really, rather quickly, you bought Mint, and instead of doing what large companies do a lot of the time when they buy a startup, which is extinguishing it, uh, you kept the product, you kept the brand. Uh, it seemed like you pretty quickly decided there was more opportunity in Mint than Quicken Online. Can, can you talk about not just the decision to acquire Mint, but also the decision to handle it the way you did? 
Yeah, we uh, we blew the curtain on wine chapters in Mint Vitas, Square. Square. Mint also had uh, an alternate business model that we really were intrigued by. So we really loved the team, loved their approach. So we acquired them and we then gave the Mint team responsibility for not just Mint, but for Quicken. Figured, let's get that new, those new ideas, that DNA, deeply into the company. So Quicken then reported to the Mint team. Uh, and that's uh, turned out as we had would have hoped. The high end of the range, Mint has grown, I think, eightfold since we acquired it. Um, and then we've taken the business model and used the Mint team to teach the rest of the company. So we're now deploying that uh, revenue model in other parts of the business. Uh, and we've actually worked to mintify a bunch of our businesses. So if any of you um, are a new sign up to QuickBooks Online, so now all the emphasis we have for QuickBooks is on QuickBooks Online. And the very latest version that they viewed uh, in November has a whole new user interface. User design, vastly modernized, simplified, and basically on a mint design. Um, and that is the future of QuickBooks. Existing QuickBooks users will get that interface in the months ahead. Um, right now, all new users. Uh, so that it's been, you're right, it has, uh, like QuickBooks was transformative, the mint acquisition has, as best we had hoped, been transformative to us. So when I think about Intuit, I think about a company that works harder than most to listen to its customers. I've been to some of the town halls you hold. Does that date back to the 1980s, or is that something you developed along the way? Is, I think you've already touched on some earlier examples of you listening to people. Yeah, um, so it started with the very beginning in, the, in 83, when we started doing you know, the research to understand what, what consumers actually did, the usability uh, studies that we didn't call it usability. Um, what's changed is our methods have advanced with the ability to get data from all of our online businesses. One thing I've learned is to trust behaviors. There's a lesson I've gotten in the last 30 years on understanding customers. is to focus on their behaviors, not their words. We, um, we in our payroll division, we're the largest provider of payroll services to companies in the United States. Um, a, a business that we uh, incubated inside and grew. Um, and when you start up payroll, you've got a bunch of questions you got to answer, data you got to put in so that we can do the payroll checks accurately. The whole industry does that. Unfortunately, we found out that when people arrive at our site, new customers, they want to, it's payday. 60% of them arrive on payday, which means they want paychecks immediately. But the payroll industry is set up to give you paychecks in two days, the first day. And so, a, uh, we had acquired very late in our history a uh, small startup group in payroll well. And one of their engineers had the idea, well, let's flip it. Why force people to do all that setup stuff? The new customer, when, they, when all they want to do is cut paychecks, let's cut paychecks first and then do setup later and correcting everything later. There's a lot of technical work needed to pull that off, but that was his idea. But he tried to get his startup that he was at to do it, and they wouldn't. Because nobody ever does that. This is not blah, 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 blah. So once we acquired it, we, we've adopted an experimentalist approach. So we free people to run experiments. So with that new freedom, he dusted this idea off. They did the little consumer research where they showed a high quality mock-up to 20 payroll customers. Zero for 20 said they used his flipped startup method. Zero. But he really believed it. And we had Eric Reese in coaching teams as we were trying to gear up and get the experimental approach working. And one, one of the teams was his. And so Eric talked through with them what could be rapid testing. And 24 hours later, they did a rapid test. In that rapid test, when you just offer it to people, don't ask if they would, but take the actual stream of new customers and offer it. You want the old way or the new way? 58% chose the new way. Now, the new way didn't work yet. It was just a screen. Um, so we had to apologize for those folks. Then, but that 58% did what the survey said 0% would do. So that gave us the, the team and the boldness to build it. They built it out. Now the payroll divisions have as fast as growth in 10 years. So what I've learned is don't focus on asking people what they might or would or could or should do. Look what they actually do. And then, and if you've got something you want to try, make it an experiment to see what people actually do. With real people really choosing for real with real time and money. Base your decisions on that. 
Well, that's been my biggest learning about customer immersion in the last decade. Scott, how do you define your own role within Intuit? Seems like you're comfortable not micromanaging this thing you've created. Um, what do you bring to the table, and, and how did you figure that out over the years? I'm still trying to figure out what I bring to the table. But, um, so I um, was CEO for the first 11 years, but then since then have hired uh, and or promoted uh, folks to be CEOs. So right now, our current CEO, Brad Smith, is phenomenal. He's so much better than I would be in the same job. Um, so I uh, help him, and I help folks in the company. A lot of my recent focus has been to, um, we run internally as a network of startups and really help build the skills of our internal entrepreneurs about how to be successful entrepreneurs. Uh, and then create the environment around them so they can experiment and innovate rapidly. Um, just yesterday I was uh, met with one team and coached four of our internal startup teams. One team sponsors a husband and wife team. Uh, it's kind of fun. Um, the, uh, so that's a lot of what I do. And then try to extract what's the learning about how you succeed as an entrepreneur. What are the kind of guideposts that our internal startups, we have about over 200 internal startup teams inside the company. Uh, what, and so, and then try to teach and make those approaches become happy, easy. So I brought along an example of how that works. We're actually gonna look at some of the uh, learnings and how we try to operationalize being a, uh, an entrepreneur. Let's see if this works. Okay, so one thing I've come to believe so we're going to actually do the actual things that I do with some of the entrepreneurs in the company. Uh, one thing I've come to believe is that entrepreneurship is the intersection of three circles, which hopefully will arise on the screen. Uh, okay. <laughs> Underneath your chairs, we have a backup plan. Underneath your chairs might be a white envelope taped underneath your chairs. Okay. <laughs> Now, take out what's in there. A few of you may have something saying you win a prize. And I've got the prizes right here. So the prizes are a Google Chromecast. If you don't have one, this is the fastest selling electronics item at uh, Amazon. So some of the envelopes may have a little uh, indication that you're a prize winner. If you have that, stand it up and show it to me. See if anyone got something right there. Yes. Can you catch? There you go. Anyone else got one? Anyone else? No one else has it. Now look carefully. Look carefully. Any other winners out there? Okay, we may give some of these out later. Okay, now, here we go, slides. So I think successful entre entrepreneurship lives in the intersection of three circles. I went back and studied all our new businesses, the flocks and the winners, and the thing that made the winners different was each one of the winners found an important but unsolved problem for the customer, and a problem that we could solve, and where we thought we could build durable advantage, so we didn't get crushed by some competitor. So that's the sweet spot. So to operationalize that, you'll notice in your, uh, in your uh, group there is a sheet that we um, give out. People can fill it in or they don't have to, but it helps focus people on what the vision is. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to take out your pens and we're gonna do a little case and you're gonna get to fill it out. I'll ask you in a moment to fill out, begin filling out these two sections. What's the big problem? and why do you believe you can solve it? Now we're gonna do a real case, real case history here, the invention of the iPod. Um, so that's the successful product. But what was the situation that Tony Fidel and, and John Rubenstein encountered? So Pre-iPod, what was the situation for people who wanted to listen to mobile digital music? Here is a Wired Magazine article that describes the situation as it existed in 2000. And I think you have a copy in your deck. So read that article and then figure out how you'd fill out what the problem is and then what the solution could be.
just a hint. I put bold type on things to pay attention to. Okay, for speed, you guys can finish it later. I'll show you uh, somewhere in here is a draft. Well, there was a draft in the deck, but I guess it's missing. <clears throat> um, but the article lists all the problems, and Apple had most of the gear, or could acquire most of the stuff that needed to solve it, and to solve pretty much every problem that was identified. Interestingly, on the bottom one, is there a network effect there? There really wasn't one. Um, okay, let's go to the next thing we asked teams to do. <clears throat> We're big believers in the experimentalist approach. We were working on this starting in 2007. We started rolling out the company in 2008. In 2009, I discovered Eric Ries, and I found a video online, and I said, oh my god, this guy is talking about the same thing. He just explains it better, and has thought more thoroughly about it. So one of the first things you got to have is a vision. So that's why we start with the vision that we just worked on. Early in the process, though, you've got to translate that vision into what are the leaps of faith. So what are the assumptions? that have to be true for this idea to work, big time. Now, which of those that are leaps of faith are the ones that really aren't documented or good evidence for? So, that's what we're going to work on our next uh, little practice session. So now we're going to go back to 2009 and a situation in our TurboTax division. So we make TurboTax. TurboTax, historically, is a web app that you use on your browser. Historically, it requires you to fill in a bunch of boxes and type in a bunch of numbers. These, for example, being the numbers you have to type in off your W-2. Okay, a team had a vision, a team in our San Diego unit that makes TurboTax. Can we do taxes without typing? Could we suck the data in, freeing the user from having to type all that stuff in, freeing the user from having even to read the forms? So, the idea was, so we, we know it's a hassle to do, we know that it keeps people from using TurboTax. Um, we also know that the pure online uh, will take us years to do because there's so many data sources, they're so diffuse. There are 100,000 points of data origination for tax data in the country. Uh, and we've been already working five years to wire up payroll so you could get your W-2 electronically. And after five years, we had about a third of the paychecks in the United States. So the rest of the documents would take us five to 10 years more. So this team said, let's not wait for that. Let's use OCR. People now have phones. Phones have cameras. In 2009, they were pretty shoddy cameras, but they got cameras. Can we use the phone to suck the data off documents and fill it into TurboTax online? So that was the vision document. And if you could do that, you could save people a lot of time and a lot of hassle. Okay. So the next piece becomes the Leap of Faith worksheet, I filled out the top. And now if you could go to the blank one and say, what are the Leap of Faith, what are the assumptions? What has to be true in order for this idea to work big time? And write those down in that big box that says assumptions. Now I'll give you four minutes. about another minute.
Okay, so what were some of the assumptions that have to be true for this idea to work big time? Raise your hand. Yes, sir? You have a really small error rate. Yes, you have to have a very low error rate. What, what were other assumptions? Yes? The user has a high phone or some other system. Yeah, the user has to have a device that could do this. Um, other assumptions? Yes? Transmission needs to be secure. The transmission needs to be secure so people don't worry about it. Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir? Changes in behavior. Yes, there's a behavior change here. One, the use of the phone and also interrupting. You're working away in TurboTax Online, and then you've got to take out your phone and do some stuff, and then you've got to go back to TurboTax Online. That's a, so a series of behavior. Now, the team had already talked to taxpayers, and taxpayers did not want to do taxes with the phone. They said, no, that, that's not going to work. So the whole idea was, could this be a data acquisition add-on to TurboTax? Okay, so those are uh, a whole bunch of these, and it, in fact, they were all the kind of crucial delight hypotheses. If you couldn't get these to work, so they, the team started testing. There was real doubt in the engineering organization whether this was even feasible because the cameras were cruddy, the W2 forms were ugly and poorly printed, uh, the lighting wasn't very good, they, they had to do stuff. This wasn't OCR done locally, the OCR was done off of a server, so you had to transmit enough of the image. Uh, could it be fast enough? So the team started experimenting. Most of the technology vendors they talked to thought it could not be done. Um, in the process of experimenting on the accuracy question, which was the major first one they had to tackle, they mocked it up so that they could have actual users kind of test drive the experience. And the users would start in TurboTax, take out their phone, they take some pictures and do that. And then the user's reaction in these tests was odd. The user starts saying, okay, so I got the phone out, I'm doing this, I want to keep going on my phone. Which, remember, is the total opposite of what they told us when he, we surveyed them earlier. Another proof, you can't trust surveys. So the, the, the team switched their emphasis to saying, why get people to go back and forth, TurboTax online, to the phone and back? Let's build it all into the phone. So in 2010, they, they debuted this thing called SnapTax. They could take a simple tax return, 1040EZ, and now it'll be 1040EZ and A and do your taxes entirely on the phone using this technology which they got to work. And here is, so they continued the experiments and learning. This, is, this team became an experimentation machine. And here's what they came up with. And let's see if this, well there's a little video that's supposed to play here. Oh well. The, uh, we can skip the video, but the result is uh, on the Apple App Store and the Google uh, Play, and it's the highest rated thing we have ever built. Consistently five stars, I just checked this morning, and the reviews are unlike anything I've seen before. One guy, uh, uh, lots of people say they're done in 10 minutes with their taxes. One guy said, I just finished my taxes in the bathtub. Uh, another woman said, I'm, I'm in the recovery room after surgery, and I just finished my taxes. And my favorite was a guy uh, two years ago on April 4th, excuse me, February 14th. And he wrote in saying, I just finished taxes in bed with my girlfriend. She's so excited, she might even wear the gift I just gave her. Because <laughs> it was Valentine's Day. So, all because of a team that didn't say, didn't take no for an answer and kept running experiments. So we've, uh, there's a URL up there. Um, let's see if we can get the URL. So you can get copies of these documents. Well, maybe in the back they can bring up the final page. There it is. And with that, why don't we move to questions? Yeah, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Now, now what stage do you actually have to accept your answer? And what stage do you have to accept your answer? Ah, well, what stage do you accept? No is an answer. So this would be in the process of running experiments. What, what we coach teams to do is, when the experiment doesn't work as you expect it, and most don't, then your job is to go in and understand why. What's the root cause? Look for surprises. If, in doing that, it confirms that the problem is still a real problem, then there's probably something wrong about your solution, and keep trying. It might confirm the solution that the problem just isn't the problem you thought, in which case it's a good reason to switch, pivot to a totally new problem. 
But the answer is all in the diagnosis of the root cause to why it didn't work. Yes, the gentleman in red there. Um, so you guys have the new uh, online app where if a third party wants to integrate with QuickBooks Online, right? It's a little hard to hear. Oh, sorry. Can, is it better? Yeah, it is. Okay. So you guys have a new QuickBooks Online uh, environment where if a third party web app needs to integrate with QuickBooks yes. Online, yes. that's great, but I have a very fundamental issue. Why do I have to pay you? to use the API, which your customer is already paying you to use it, yeah. and, and I'm creating the API. Yeah, I, think we just, I think we just dropped the charges to oh. zero. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good point, I agree. <laughs> I'm Sasha, I'm the founder of Eversnap. And I had a question, in those six months that you guys were out of money, um, how many people did you have on your team? And how did you get them to keep on working with you? And what was the reason that um, investors were telling you no? And what was the reason that investors were telling you no? Well, what was the reason investors were telling us no? Um, I'll do that in the second part of your question. Uh, it was, uh, it's not hard to understand when you step back. Venture capital at the time, this is 1984, almost entirely funded industrial products, semiconductors, stuff sold to corporations. They had virtually never sold a consumer, uh, back to a consumer product, even personal computers at the time, the initial audiences and users were in corporations. And we were saying, we were, we were selling to consumers. And we wanted to put all the money into TV advertising, into advertising, and VCs had no experience in advertising. So you probably shouldn't invest in something you really don't understand. Uh, also, we had a team who had no background in doing this. I was a former fat oil salesman from P&G, and my co-founder had just graduated from, no, hadn't yet graduated from Stanford. Um, so we didn't look like the dream team. So I think there's good reasons why they didn't invest. Uh, plus, the dominant mentality at the time was software sold by the pound. The more features, the better. And we were going in the exact opposite direction. So we were going to sell products with vastly fewer features to ensure that they were delightfully easy. And that was that message fell on deaf ears in the investment. So then, how did people keep going? We had seven employees. We shrunk to four when we stopped paying salary. Um, I guess fundamentally, they just believed that we had a better solution. That we, our solution would transform people's financial lives and competitors would not. The fundamental thing is they just believed. Well, thank you, audience. Those were great questions, and thank you, Scott, so much. This was just fabulous. Okay, right here. Oh, watch it. Very good. Got a guy. Okay. 